Hello, lovely listener. I am starting today's episode off a little bit differently. I've waited a few episodes in before I start doing this because I really wanted to give you the opportunity to see if this is a podcast that genuinely enriches your life. And if you are returning and this is not the first episode you've listened to, then I'm going to assume that you're at least intrigued and you're enjoying this content. So if that's you, first of all, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. But I'm going to ask you to do something which, if you've listened to any other podcast, you have heard this request before, but it really does make a difference. I would be so grateful if you would follow or subscribe to this podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your podcasts and specifically that you would leave a review on Apple Podcasts to share why you enjoy listening. I know everybody asks for this but it's because it really does make a difference and we podcast creators put a lot of time and effort to creating valuable content and we want it to get to as many people as possible and subscriptions and reviews really do help make that happen. So if you have time, I would be so unbelievably grateful if you would subscribe and leave a review for this on Apple Podcasts. If that's something that you don't have time to do, I'd be equally grateful if you maybe just recommend this to a friend, to someone you think would enjoy it. That would make just as big of a difference because we just want to get this message out there to as many people as possible. And lastly, I want to remind you, because I don't mention it in the episode itself, that this podcast is accompanied by an exclusive book club community over on Substack where we dig deeper into conversations around C.S. Lewis and all the theological questions that come up. I also have exclusive podcast episodes over there with content that is only available to book club members. So if that's something that you're interested in, it's £5 a month to join and you can do so by heading on over to magiclikethis.substack.com Equally, if you would just like to be a free subscriber to Magic Like This, you can do so and still receive pieces of the book club content that I write for book club every week and those will go straight to your inbox for free. So head on over to magiclikethis.substack.com if you would like to join book club. Okay, let's get into the episode, shall we? One of the books on the required reading list when I was a freshman in high school was The Count of Monte Cristo, and it's a fabulous book by Alexandre Dumas. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it's a fabulous book. It's one of the classics, and I'm a really slow reader, so in school I would have to commit in order to finish a book in the allotted time we were given before we had to take a test or write an essay. I really had to fight to get through books and it's not because I don't love reading. Obviously, I love reading. I host a book club, but I am a slow reader. I've always been a slow reader. And let me tell you, I have never had more sheer will to complete a book than I did the 900 gold gilded pages that was The Count of Monte Cristo. So imagine my absolute fury When I discovered at the end of the longest book known to mankind, yes, I know that's not technically true, but when you're 14, that's how it feels. And imagine my fury when I discovered that I read the abridged version. 900 pages was abridged and I had to pick my jaw up off the ground, but I was not willing to commit to read the additional 200 pages of the full version of The Count of Monte Cristo. And then I went and I watched the film, which was delightfully only two hours long. And I'm going to go against every literary nerd code out there when I say I actually thought the film was better. Shh, don't tell anybody. I really did think that they did a better job condensing the plot and getting all the main themes and creating more compelling character development. Towards the end of the book, I just thought, oh, this is never going to end and how many different character arcs are going to happen for one character. And I actually didn't like the main character by the end and I didn't like the way it ended. Whereas they changed the ending in the film and it felt like a much more rewarding ending to someone who had committed to watching this character for 900 pages. Oh, no, wait. That was reading the character. I only had to watch him for two hours. Can you tell I have a complicated relationship with this book? Why am I telling you any of this? Okay. 
spoiler alert, just by the way, if you haven't read this classic novel or watched the film and you really want to, uh, maybe pause this and, and go watch the 2002 film with Jim Caviezel. You won't be sorry. He's also really handsome. Okay, let's move on. Spoiler alert, out of the way. So <laughs> why am I telling you all of this? Well, in the first half of the film, you get really invested in the main character, Edmond Dantes, and, or Dante, I'm really sorry if I pronounce these things wrong. And I'm also one of those people that gets really frustrated when people mispronounce things. Um, so hello, humility, I might be one of those people. But this character goes through a very harrowing first half of the film. So he is just this happy-go-lucky guy. He's got his best friend. He's got a job he loves. He's got his gorgeous girl. And he's just saving up for money for a ring. Can you hear just like the twangy violin playing in the background to this guy's life and then his best friend turns on him and frames him for a crime that he didn't commit and he ends up being imprisoned and this era of French prisons not so swanky not so nice they did not get you know wine and bread and cheese as their three meals a day it was grim he gets sent off to this horrible horrible prison and over time his spirit is just broken and he goes from this guy full of hope and faith, faith in God, faith in life, to just completely cynical, no faith at all. And he ends up befriending the priest who's in the cell next to him and they work together to slowly try to dig themselves out of this prison using the spoons from their meals and other crude tools that they fashion and they build this really intense friendship. And what's incredible to Edmund is that the priest has not lost his faith in God, despite having been in prison for a heck of a long time. And towards the end of this project of digging themselves out, there is an accident and the priest gets injured and Edmund carries him out of the tunnel that they've been digging and the priest begins to die in his arms. And I was so struck by this quote that they brought in to the, the script of this book. The priest is essentially encouraging Edmund to, to finish the project and get out and to depend on God in his life. And Edmund goes, but I don't believe in God anymore. And the priest says, that's okay. God believes in you. And I was beyond stunned, humbled, in awe. I don't know. My little 14-year-old self just thought, wow, what a concept, right? The idea that God's existence actually doesn't depend on my belief. And beyond that, God's love for me and his investment in my life doesn't depend on my investment in even his own existence. God is completely unreliant on whether I believe he's real or not. And even if I don't believe he's real, he still believes in me, he still loves me, he still wants me. That was what I took from this, yes, fictional story, but, you know, if you're here, you're probably here because you believe that God can speak to us through artistic works of fiction, right? And I hung on to that. I don't believe in God that's okay. God believes in you. You're listening to Magic Like This, a C.S. Lewis book club podcast. I'm your host, Christina Wallace, and this season we are looking at the screw tape letters. We're going letter by letter, and today we're looking at letter number four. So let's dive straight in, shall we? She says after making like a five minute segue into the Count of Monte Cristo. You're not here for an Alexander Dumas book club. You're here for a C.S. Lewis book club. Sorry, guys. But I've shared that little tidbit with you because this letter focuses in a lot on prayer and how we relate to God and how God relates to us and how the way we think about God and God's existence really impacts our prayer life, but how ultimately God is God regardless of how we view him 
And the only person that we're punishing by choosing to view him as less than who he is, is ourselves. So let's have a look at what screw tape is getting at here in this fourth letter. I'm grabbing my copy. So as always, I'm going to take little bits and pieces from this letter and I'm quoting in skipping around a little bit. So one of the things he says is keep the patient from the serious intention of praying altogether. Produce in him a vaguely devotional mood in which real concentration of will and intelligence have no part. So what is this mood that Screwtape is talking about? This mood void of all concentration and intelligence. That little uh, thread of advice to Wormwood of producing a devotional mood is piggybacked onto this idea that he wants the patient to think of prayer in a particular way. Now remember, the patient is a new convert to Christianity. This is presumably a British patient. And so we as the readers are operating on the assumption that this patient has a traditional British education and background, which will have informed his understanding of Christianity. And Screwtape is kind of playing on that background and telling Wormwood, get the patient to think of prayer as he remembered prayer in his school days. Now, I didn't attend a Church of England elementary school. You've probably worked out from my accent that I am not natively British, but I know quite a bit about C of E primary schools. I have friends who are teachers. I've been in and around that environment. And I know that one of the elements of Church of England primary schools is daily prayer. So screw tape is essentially saying, get the patient to think of prayer as that kind of boring liturgical practice and, and, and let him think that that's kind of all that prayer once was before he truly came to know God and become a Christian. And now that he knows God, almost give him this desire to revolt against that quote unquote boring liturgy, so much so that he only prays through a sense of wishy-washy feeling and emotion because it's, you know, sexy and freestyle and a lot more heartfelt than the boring liturgy of his primary school days. I'm hoping desperately that you're catching my sarcasm in tone because I'm tired of saying quote unquote all the time. It's really hard to talk to you when I can't see you. So just reading into my tone shifts here. Screwtape is trying to get the patient into a state of mind where he thinks he's praying very authentically and emotionally and much less in a boring way than what he remembers his primary school day prayers to be. But actually what he's doing is producing in him a sort of lethargy, a sort of apathy, where he prays through like a sense of feeling without actually bringing in concentration and thoughtfulness and intention into his prayers. What this is producing is a sort of lazy prayer that's weighted more in emotion than in conscious thought of either the subject of the prayer, so who the patient's praying for, or the reality of what prayer actually is, which just as a reminder, prayer is the act of literally speaking to the creator of the heavens and the earth. The, the one being who exists outside of time and space, who is omniscient, who is everywhere at once, and yet who specifically wants to know you. Sorry if that sounds heavy. It is heavy. And it's awesome that we get to talk to God like that, that we have open access to him. And Screwtape's trying to get the patient so preoccupied with the nature of the prayer, is it heartfelt or is it liturgical and boring? By the way, I am not implying that liturgy is boring. I actually think liturgy is stunning. I think Lewis is kind of getting at that as well. But Screwtape's trying to distract the patient from the true act of what it means to pray, the magnitude of what it means that he gets to pray, even distracting him from the people he's praying for in exchange for a lazy prayer that's not really well concentrated, that's not really thought out, that's not intentional. And I do just want to say, if you are one of those people that thinks, well, gosh, I, I kind of just pray through my emotions. I, I don't sit in a dark room 
on my knees praying with sweat pouring down my face, I pray emotionally as well. I pray through a sense of thought and feeling all throughout my day. So I'm not necessarily implying, and I don't think Lewis is implying this either, although I can't speak for him, that that kind of prayer is inherently wrong. But bearing in mind that the context of this letter is for a new Christian convert, someone who is just discovering what it means to pray to the living God. And if he can produce in him an initially lazy form of prayer, he will remove the patient's willingness or ability to discover the deeper, intense, beautiful aspects of prayer as an invitation to commune with God and with the Holy Spirit. So don't necessarily think that praying through emotion is wrong. I am definitely not saying that. But what I am saying is that if that's all we do, and we never set aside time to pray in a sense of the magnitude of what we're doing, pray with a sense of gratitude and appreciation for how amazing it is that we get to access the living God wherever we are, we're missing an element of the intimacy that God's inviting us into. And that's exactly what screw tape is trying to do, is rob the patient of the intimacy that God is inviting him into. Now, I'm going to move on and quote the next little part of this letter that I want to focus in on today. And it's funny because I did actually just say, you know, it doesn't matter if you're sitting alone in a dark room on your knees. I, I don't think it necessarily always matters that you're sitting in a dark room alone on your knees. I rarely pray on my knees because I've got arthritis and it hurts. But the funny thing is that the next section of this letter that I want to focus in on actually addresses the bodily position that we take when we pray. So Screwtape says this, At the very least, they can be persuaded that the bodily position makes no difference to their prayers, for they constantly forget what you must always remember, that they are animals, and that whatever their bodies do affects their souls. Now, I found this particular point really difficult, because as I just said, I don't often physically get down on my knees because I have an arthritic condition and it hurts. It physically hurts for me to do that. And I'm not necessarily saying that if you don't get down on your knees or especially if you do have any sorts of physical ailment that prevents you from doing so, that you are somehow praying in a less legitimate way. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not getting at that at all. I think that what Lewis is trying to imply here through Screwtape's letter is more the the fact that we forget the relationship between our flesh and our spirit. Now, if you are someone listening to this and you're from a church background, I am going to operate on the assumption that you've heard some of the same messages that I grew up hearing in church, which is that the flesh and the spirit are at war with each other, that the flesh is inherently bad and the spirit is good and we must work based on our spirit and not our flesh. These are ideas based in some letters from the Apostle Paul to particular churches in the New Testament. I think that it's really important that those letters are read in context because the people he's writing to needed to hear those words for a particular reason. But I'm going to offer a hot take here. I'm going to remind you that the first thing that God said over mankind when he made our bodies in Genesis was, this is good. That included our bodies. Yes, I know that was before the fall. If you're someone listening to this and you are not from a Christian background, you can just kind of take this in stride. But for those of you who are listening who are immediately thinking that I'm some sort of heretic because I'm asserting that we are not inherently bad, there's a lot of theological background here that I'm not going to get into. But what I will say is the idea that we are inherently bad following the fall of Adam and Eve actually comes more from an idea called Gnosticism. It doesn't come directly from Christianity. Now, I'm not saying that we're not sinful and I'm not saying that we're not broken, but I don't believe personally that we are first bad and evil, particularly that our bodies are bad. And the reason I don't believe that is that I choose to claim the very first thing that God spoke over mankind, which is, this is good. I remember the first time I heard that. I was sitting in Christian camp. I was 18. I just graduated high school. And I actually 
watched as our camp leader knelt down in the dirt and scooped up the dirt with his hands and formed a shape. And he said, God literally knelt down and made you out of the dust and looked at you and said, this is good. And I never forgot that. I felt the Holy Spirit in that moment speaking truth over me. And the reason I'm zoning in on this is because when we talk about this war between the flesh and the spirit, don't get me wrong, our bodies absolutely want things sometimes that our spirits know we shouldn't. We absolutely do things sometimes that we know are bad for us. Even Paul says it, the things I don't want to do, I keep doing, and the things I want to do, I can't seem to do. What a wretched man I'm becoming. This is something that the Apostle Paul literally says. We can very often be at war between our flesh and our spirit. However, I don't think that that is the only story that is told about our relationship between body and spirit. I think that there's also a stunning invitation for our body and spirit to commune together in worship, in experiencing God's presence, in pouring out delight of being God's creation, not only through our spirit and our prayers, but through how we use our physical bodies. There are so many secular practices that I think do a better job of reconnecting the flesh and the spirit that Christians, quite frankly, dismiss as woo or witchcraft. And I just don't think that that is giving enough credibility to God's invitation to us as humans in a body that exists and is called good by the Almighty. If our flesh, if flesh itself didn't matter, if a human body wasn't part of a spiritual experience, I'm not convinced that Jesus would have come down as a man to win a spiritual victory for us in a physical body. I think that our bodies offer us an opportunity to participate in our spirituality in even deeper ways. And I do think that what we do with our bodies has an impact on our souls. Take from that what you will. Yes, that might mean that certain ways that we've chosen to use our bodies can chip away at the health of our souls. I can't tell you, because I don't know your story, whether you have used your body for the wellness of your soul or not. What I can tell you is I think all of us carry some sort of weight, some sort of pain, some sort of ache. For me, it's a physical pain. It's arthritis. And so overcoming that And using my body to the fullness of delight and worship and prayer and experiencing God's presence, it's hard. And I don't think that God looks down on us when we fail to use our bodies in a way that optimizes our experience as spiritual and physical beings. I just think that we're constantly being invited into more. And I think that experiencing God shouldn't just be emotional and mental and spiritual. I think we can experience God in the deeply physical, in our bodies, and in practices like mindfulness and meditation, I like to meditate on God's presence. I like to meditate on scripture. And I like to do that through being aware of my breathing and aware of the sensations in my body. I think that grounding practices and and connecting ourselves with the physical world around us and becoming deeply present in our bodies is an invitation to experience God. And so, yes, I think that Lewis is bang on the money when he says that our position in prayer, even if most of the time we're praying when we're driving to work or when we wake up in the morning, if we do take time out as well to think of our physical position in prayer, maybe down on our knees, I'm saying this for myself just as much, reminds us of our position as children and servants of the loving, living God. I would like to use my body to remind my soul of who God is. And that moves along nicely to the next thing that Screwtape is trying to rob the patient of. He says to Wormwood, essentially, that if all else fails, get the patient so preoccupied with his own thoughts with the act of praying rather than with the one to whom he is praying that he kind of forgets that God is part of the conversation. 
He says this to Wormwood. Whenever people are attending to the enemy himself, by enemy he means God, we are defeated, but there are ways of preventing them from doing so. The simplest is to turn their gaze away from him towards themselves. Keep them watching their own minds and trying to produce feelings, thereby the action of their own wills. When they meant to pray for courage, let them really be trying to feel brave, for instance. Teach them to estimate the value of each prayer by their success in producing the desired feeling. So this goes back again to a concept that Lewis really likes to zone in on in different contexts. And it's the difference between thinking about the thing and our thoughts about thinking about the thing versus the thing itself. It doesn't even make sense as I say it, but I know what I'm trying to say. I hope you know what I'm trying to say. There is a difference between thinking about doing something versus actually doing it. And effectively, we can easily, and I, I do this, we can judge the value of our prayers based on whether or not Through the process of praying, we manufactured the desired emotion or feeling associated with the thing we're praying for. So, Screwtape uses the example, the patient's praying for courage. Let him, instead of truly be asking God for courage, be in fact trying to feel brave himself. So, prayer becomes this manufacturing plant by which we are actually just searching to answer our own prayers and we're forgetting about the power of the one to whom we're praying and we are becoming so self-reliant through our prayers that we lose the restful act of surrender in recognizing that God is God and we are not and the reason we're asking him is because we can't do it ourselves and what's more if we go to God asking for something like courage but deep down we're really just trying to feel brave and then we personally fail to feel brave because we prayed for it, we can trick ourselves into thinking, well, God didn't answer my prayer. But we were never truly in a state of surrendering and asking him because we trusted him. We were almost using our own emotions as a safety net, trying to manufacture within us a sense that our prayer had been answered that was completely separate from whether or not God was actually part of the conversation. I hope this is making sense, guys. It's kind of meta. But I do this a lot. The thing about praying like this is that once again, it robs us of intimacy with God. It makes us forget his power. It makes us forget how privileged we are to talk to someone who is so powerful And to know that that person hears us. And it gets exhausting. If we're praying for the purpose of manufacturing our own feelings, that gets tiring. There's no rest because we aren't surrendering to God's power. We're not humbling ourselves to remember that God is God and we are not. We're still relying on ourselves to answer our own prayers. And we get caught out in our pride there again in a way that we don't even necessarily recognize because we think we're asking God when really we're trying to generate the answer ourselves. One of the most beautiful privileges that we have in having direct access to God through prayer is resting in the knowledge that God is God and we are not. Remember Edmund Dantes, I don't believe in God. That's okay. He believes in you. God is God regardless of whether or not we can manufacture feelings in response to our own prayers. God is God and he is hearing you regardless of whether or not you acknowledge that he is in the room with you by the power of his Holy Spirit. And this brings me to a part of Screwtape's letter that I love. This is the first time where I actually sense Lewis's full act of worship towards God and declaring who God is through Screwtape's moaning about who God is, through Screwtape's frustration of recognizing who God is. Lewis is actually worshiping and acknowledging the beauty of God. So this is what Screwtape says about God. He is cynically indifferent to the dignity of his position and ours as pure spirits. And to human animals on their knees, 
he pours out self-knowledge in a quite shameless fashion. I love this. In surrendering to the power of who God is, in remembering that God is God and we are not, we are not just left as meager, pitiful little bodies spread out on the floor. In fact, God, despite the dignity of his position as the almighty and maker of the universe, actually pours out knowledge to us. He disregards the fact that he owes us nothing and instead gives us everything, including direct access to him through prayer. When we rest in the fact that God is God and we are not through our prayers, when we come to him with absolutely no misconception that we can manufacture an answer to our prayers and every understanding that it is God alone whose power marks our lives. We're not just left there wanting, but often God dips down from his throne room into our situations and is present with us. Screwtape hates it because what an honor that we are seen and touched and heard by the Almighty. All Screwtape wants to do is prevent us from knowing that truth in our prayers. And he goes on to encourage Wormwood by all means necessary to make sure that the patient remains in this state of blindness to that intimacy of God's presence. He wants the patient to be completely ignorant to the God he's praying to. Instead, replacing the image of the almighty God in his mind with some sort of material object, it's really fascinating the nitty gritty that Lewis gets into here when he's talking about how we pray. Screwtape says, I have known cases where what the patient called his God was actually located up and to the left at the corner of the bedroom ceiling or inside his own head or in a crucifix on the wall. But whatever the nature of the composite object, you must keep him praying to it, to the thing that he has made, not to the person who has made him. He says, prevent the patient from recognizing the completely real, external, invisible presence, presence with a capital P, meaning God, that's there with him in the room. When we pray... If we forget to picture God as the luminous and very real presence in the room with us, and instead we replace him with some sort of picture that we've conjured up in our minds, whether it's a painting that we've seen, or a crucifix, or the sky, we are using limited material objects to box in the limitless God, the almighty presence in the room with you. Don't mistake the object to which you might attach your view of God, your picture of God in your mind, with God himself. I would even challenge you to sit with the discomfort of not having any material way of picturing him in your mind and allowing that vastness to overcome you and surround you and maybe even hold you close and make you feel safe in this weird backward way, the mystery of God's presence might envelop you in a sense of safety because you are reminded once again whether you believe in God he believes in you he is God and you are not and in your prayers you are invited to come to that incredible throne room with a presence so vast and powerful and good that there is nothing in this world that you have yet seen that would enable you to be able to picture it in your own mind experience the fullness of that mystery that magic, that wonder when you pray. It humbles us and it helps remove our pride and our urge to manufacture an answer to our own prayers. It gives us the true rest of surrender to the vastness of our God. Prayer is just as much an invitation to draw near to God and experience the love of our maker as it is an invitation to intercede for people, for those we love, for our own situation. God hears your prayers. The amount that I am hearing again and again as I read through the Psalms of how much God hears us. But prayer is not just a transaction. Prayer is not just the act of asking for something and receiving it. And if you've been walking a Christian journey for a while, you'll know that sometimes, often, 
we don't receive things, or at least not in the way we expect. And yet prayer holds so much eternal value. When we pray in such a way as to forget the God to whom we're praying by picturing that God as a mere corner on the wall or by preoccupying ourselves with manufacturing the feelings we want, we're falling into that trap again of of pride, of assuming that our understanding, our assumptions, our pictures, our thoughts, our feelings are indicative of the success of a prayer, of the value of a prayer, of the greatness of the God to whom we're praying. This pride robs us of wonder and gratitude and intimacy and the safety that comes with that intimacy and rest and trust and hope and love. It robs us of all of it. Something that I didn't get to chat through with you in our episode looking at the preface was a section where Lewis reminds the reader that the devil is a liar. And it felt like a good time to bring that up because there is going to be times periodically throughout the book where I look at what Screwtape is saying and I'm like, he's lying. Even to himself, he is lying. He's making a statement about us as humans that isn't true. And I think he knows it. And this next bit, this bit that I kind of want to finish with, is one of those moments where I think, hmm, the devil is a liar. So he finishes off this letter to Wormwood, basically saying that if we put all our hubris aside, if we lay down our expectations, if we lay down our feelings and emotions and our pictorial view of God and instead step into the fullness of his presence through the act of prayer, Screwtape says we don't actually want what we'll find in that space. He says, this real nakedness of the soul in prayer, you will be helped by the fact that humans themselves do not desire it as much as they suppose. Ooh, I think the devil is a liar. I think that if we get past the initial fear of that vulnerability in our nakedness of the soul, I'd be willing to bet money that all any of us really want is to be truly known To know and be known in authenticity and realness, is that not all any of us are looking for? How often do you hear the phrase, your authentic self? All we want is to peel back all the layers and be known and seen for exactly who we are. And I think that there is a rawness to prayer in God's presence. When we put all of the pomp and circumstance aside... That offers us that nakedness of the soul that I personally don't think there's anything else in this world that can match. That level of vulnerability, authenticity. I mean, honestly, who's going to know you better than the one who made you? What's going to make you feel more affirmed and seen in the nakedness of your soul than to know that the one who made you looks at you and says, through all time and space of eternity... I've looked down, and if you were the only person in this world, I would have still died for you. Oh, tell me you don't want that as a response to the nakedness of your soul. I'm going to finish today, as I always do, with a psalm. This is Psalm 51. This is a prayer from King David after he had committed a great offense, a great sin. If you know the Bible, then you know what I'm talking about, but we won't dig into that today. We don't have time. But this is a heartfelt cry to God. This was a moment where David remembered that God is God and he is not. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. God, Create a clean heart for me, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me, and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. I hope that today you walk away encouraged by the open invitation God hands to you every second of every day to just talk with him. He loves to hear from you. And remember that when you talk to him, you don't need to feel a particular way. 
You don't need to worry that he hears you because he does. You don't need to feel as though that prayer needs to be anything other than coming to God and recognizing that he hears you, he loves you, and he is almighty. And we are not. And what a relief. Be blessed, friends. We'll catch up next week. Take care.